Hello. Uh, good morning. Today I will be leading the comparison and presentation because Ali has just forced me to do so. Um, um, for this session, I will be comparing two pieces of artwork. Uh, the first one is Rachel White Meets the House, and the second one is Sun in the Room by Edward Hopper. I can get the piece name wrong. Okay, I did a cultural framework of the house. Um, uh, but I changed it a little bit because I felt that some of the elements in other frameworks are more important than the ones which were just in the cultural framework. So to begin with, um, a brief introduction to Rachel Whiteread and the relevance of her work, The House, is that Rachel Whiteread is born in 1963 in London and she is one of the young British artists, which means that she is a contemporary artist and she's still active. And then um, she produced, she, uh, her main um, type of artwork she produces is that is including public sculptures and monumental statues. She built a lot of them. Like the first one she built was the ghost. And the ghost was actually replicating a Victorian um, era room, which is similar to the one she lived in before. I found that. Um, and then she, and then, oh, and then in all her works, uh, one significant factor which is similar is that time was the only thing absent from her work because basically she just casts everything using cement and which traps every memory, uh, every single second or every other thing which happened inside the, the, the room or the house. Uh, she also, like the, uh, the house and also the ghost is basically resonant and monuments for individuals who lived in the house as well as the collective memories that were um, gained, that were produced in the house. Uh, there were contradictions of her house, which is what I found very interesting to put under the social factor is that uh, there was one party, which is the Tate, Tate Gallery, who were so into her works for its significance in capturing time and memory, uh, where they actually um, vote, like, decided that she should be uh, presented to the Turner Prize in 1993, whereas the other party, which is the Bow neighborhood councillors, they voted for the house to be demolished in January 1994 because it delayed the development of East London region. Um, Moving on to the historical and political um, factor which I found very, very interesting is that um, the area, uh, the East End London and, and the Grove Road is basically where World War II has highly affected the region. Um, it's basically both an architectural, the house is basically both an architectural form of it open memorial which highlights the political conflict um, arise, arose during the World War II and basically the area the Grove Road is where the flying bomb first fell so uh, from my personal opinion I think she built the house in that area to, to make it as a monument for the people who served in the war died in the war or even those who were bombed out or like those survivors who are now who were um, less capable of living a, a more comfortable and natural life than those who were affected by the war. Mm. And because she has this deep meaning of the house of her work, Tate Gallery decided that she should be awarded the Turner Prize at 1993, as I have said, as I have mentioned earlier. But uh, just to add on a little bit about the Turner Prize, she actually wanted to decline the offer because.
because she is one of the only artists who produces art for its purest reasons. She, because her mother was an artist, she knew that a real artist would. She knew that a real artist wouldn't make money out of what they do, and she did. And she knew that um, wealth isn't her main purpose, so she went for more conceptual, something more personal to her. And also, when she uh, there was one point of time when she got famous, she started teaching people how to, she started teaching a collective group of students on how to cast, um, and that's when uh, she just suddenly decided to stop teaching them because uh, the students, their main motive was to be as rich as her. And I don't think I have to touch on the new word, but I find her very um, humane and uh, uh, I think she's like the true artist which is rarely um, visible in the, in the present days. Moving on to the visual analysis, basically the house, well, I wasn't able to put the picture because it was really in the space, but you can imagine the picture. Uh, basically the house is a life-size replica of a Victorian terrace house. It is the location and everything on the into nature, uh, and then it is, she, I think she chose a Victorian house, she has a thing for Victorian terrace house because she used to live in one and like I said earlier the ghost was similar to the one she lived and probably because it's at the same Victorian terrace house it was more personal and she find this she find she could have find it more mm, than comfortable and stuff. Uh, basically the process of the house it sounds complicated. No it sounds not complicated but it's actually very complicated because she actually got the perfect shape. Uh, basically, firstly, they just spray liquid into the building. The liquid here is the cement. And then uh, after it, it hardened, uh, they removed the external walls carefully. And it's an inverse representation of a three-story house because you know how people think that um, the outside of a house matters most because they want to show people that the ta -da, this is the kind of house I live in. But for her, what was inside was more personal and what and those were the things more meaningful than the outside. And then uh, it was complete it looks very complete because of the outlines of fireplaces, windows, architraves and staircases. It's very, very visible, uh, which is exactly why people find it so astonishing and they, they were taken aback the moment they saw it. Uh, and then there were indentations of domestic details that were expressed uh, in a way where she, she, um, Rachel Wyrie is an artist who finds that, uh, who likes to take something which was not, which was disregarded, something not meaningful, something very ordinary to make them something very, very extraordinary. Like the house, it was in the Grove Road. Oh, moving to the location, uh, the house is located in Grove Road. It's actually very relevant to what I was seeing uh, at the East End London. And some, actually, like most of the roads there were like um, destroyed during the World War II because of the flying bomb, including some of the houses in Grove Road, like I mentioned earlier. And 19, in the 1950s, like after war, it was covered with temporary houses. Uh, it, and then in 1993, which is like 43 years later, they pushed, they, they removed all the terrace, like including those, the house, like the houses which are similar to the house. Yeah. And there are these people who, the residents of these terrace houses were actually forced to move out by the Liberal Democrat Council because they wanted to develop the area. And then, um, basically the house is the interior of one of the last remaining terrace houses. Uh, it's basically, for, it was nothing 
special. It was it was torn down. It was um, it just it just was a sad scene because it, the house itself just um, reflects on the entire war period. But for the moment, it was made. It was built as the house. It was very special. Like ten thousand or thousands of visitors came in to look at the house. And then, which is exactly what she wants to show. And then uh, she, for her, I think she is very um, modest. She appreciates everything, including the air we breathe in. Like this space here. I think probably like her house, it was filled with a lot of things. A lot of um, uh, uh, very memoric things. And I think she wanted people to think of the normal space like that. And then in the, uh, the house is located in the middle of churches, high towers and parks, which makes it look small and vulnerable, but it was still standing up because it was special. It was casted in cement. And then she was actually thanked by two former residents because uh, they said that she actually made their memories real and collective. Like, no one really cared about them because um, East End, London, especially in Grove Road, these are the people who were like greatly affected by the war and they were very neglected by the society and all. But Rachel White, White Reed took the initiative to um, appreciate, like just just acknowledge that their presence and then. Next, the sun in the room. I did a formal framework, but similar like the previous one, I altered the elements in it a bit because I felt that there was there were more to talk about in some parts than the actual parts of the formal. Like uh, the house, I will first start off with uh, some social facts about the sun in the room. Um, it's actually created by Edward Hopper. He was born in New York, 1882. He was one of the most influential American painters, like till present date. Uh, he was a painter. Uh, oh, he was born in a middle class family, and by middle class in back then, they actually um, encouraged a lot of art, uh, especially visual arts. Than music and uh, performing groups like now. And then uh, she and she, he is a painter. Um, he similar like Rachel White Reed. He takes something very ordinary and makes it very standing out and very precious and personal for himself. He made three trips to Paris between 1906 and 1910, which influenced, which altered his entire. Um, um, a career in art. It influenced his artworks very heavily whereby because he, before this he was actually working as illustrators and just designers and he was just doing things people asked him to do but he just suddenly thought that he wanted, he had his own intentions, he wanted to pursue his imagination which is why he um, just got out of work and he made three trips to Paris. Uh, Paris at that time is the artistic center of the West Group. It's like, it's like um, American music now. It's very strong, it's very powerful. They, they stand out most in the art history at that time. And he, when he was in Paris, he was impressed by the city, um, the architecture, the lights, and the art tradition. Because uh, American at the time, it was undergoing its it was undergoing its um, expansion period, and then they were very isolated from the whole world, and they were very deformed, I would say. And he just went to Paris, and it was like a Disneyland for him. Uh, and then he was exposed. He actually went to Paris to learn about old masters. It's uh, a movement which lasted for 
100 or 200 years, I forgot, uh, before, like way before other movements started. But um, at that moment when he went, it was the abstract expressionist art movement which was leading. But and then um, at the same time, cubism was introduced, like just new, freshly introduced. So he was exposed to all three art movements first had. And he encountered with Impressionism as well, which, in which he found the light, the thematic treatment of architecture and nature very, very, uh, he found the purest thing the most precious, which is why in all of his works he highlights uh, the structure of architecture, the use of lightings. It's very, very visible. If you just type Edward Hopper on Google, you can see everything. Uh, moving on to style first. Uh, it's basically an oil canvas painting. Um, I think he personally chose all the paint, all the canvas painting because um, the strokes, every strokes of oil paint um, actually creates a very shimmering effect which actually uh, makes the wall shimmer and makes it look like it's real sunlight. Uh, and then oil enabled the artist, oil paint actually enabled him to express the numerous tones of yellow. If you see the picture, I'm sorry there's no picture now. If you see the picture, uh, in the room is basically Everything is yellow, it's just different tones from um, something warm to something very cool and then something very dull. Like the capacity, opacity of the color is very, very different. Like even on the same part of the wall, it's different. So I think he, he selected um, oil painting because it can, um, he can express the tone uh, naturally and smoothly. And then the trees outside the window looks like as though they are lit, um, as though there is air, but you, but if you see it from a different perspective, it doesn't look like air. It's just like that, it's just a form. And I'm still looking at the paint. And then uh, shadows are painted in an overlapped manner. They are not, like shadows like the walls, they have different tones as well, uh, in which he emphasized on the opacity shadow to make the entire painting look very um, three-dimensional and real. Visual analysis. Uh, the sun in the room looks like a photograph, but it is not a photograph. It has a little bit of sense of surrealism in it because uh, because because oh yeah because if you see right in the picture this one here you see you see right, there is no cast of shadow of this thing, like the, 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 the window pane. There's no cast, there's no shadow casting on there. And, then, and that's, that's, I'll explain that in simple as a metaphor. And then, um, the color theme is very simple, it's tones of yellow, but it looks a bit more brownish, so it's brownish yellow. Uh, it created a bright, yet a very solemn atmosphere. And then um, the slanting light, uh, the direction of sunlight formed into the room is quite slanted, which um, expresses whether it's dawn or dusk, it's not moon definitely. But uh, in my personal opinion, it's, I think it's dusk, because uh, in the morning it's not very yellow as the evening. And then the indoors, it's very dreamlike. Uh, there is an incandescent glow which, which um, isolates him, isolates the room from the very uh, urban society outside. Uh, and then the empty room actually created a haunted atmosphere, which I'll explain further here. And then there is simplified composition, which I think like the sun in the room is the most simplified work of his. This. And it, I think it's because you wanted to um, just emphasize on the abstract and focusing only on light and shadow.
because he was very famous uh, for it. And the shimmering light may suggest that uh, the room is either uh, not occupied, not used, or just recently vacated. Because dust, uh, shimmering light can mean that there's dust present in the room. Because if, you see, if it's just light, it doesn't make it glow, but if there's a bit of dust, you can see like think things a bit. Symbols and metaphor. It was the painting was basically done four years before his death, and this and I think it's it the painting itself is a metaphor because he was actually really really sick. He went for a lot of surgeries. I think I put it in another. I think I put it in another the other slide. Yeah, and I think the room is the memory. His, and he wanted to make it. Uh, he wants to make it uh, safe. He wants to trap all the memories, whereby all the space, the space in the room is because the space in the room is emphasized. And then there's a window. The trees outside looks wind whipped, but you can't really hear the wind. Meaning, it looks like it's wind whipped, but it's actually not. Uh, I think he's trying to explain how um, people they might look distorted or like like the American society back then they look very dull and everything but they were still enduring the pain they were still trying to get up because it was during the expansion period uh, revolution was going to start they still had hope they still um, they still had the motivation to stand up I think that's what he did that. And then um, the black walls and wheat and honey colored sunlight. I actually researched this, and some critics said that these are the two things he loved most and most comfortable with. I think uh, I think because when they said uh, they said like when we're when as we are heading towards our death, uh, we will think of the things we like most and we will recall whatever happened and everything. And I think that was the face it was. Through. And then uh, originally, they said he said that originally at the window pane there was supposed to be a woman, but at the end he changed his mind because. And then there were some critics that said that he believes that the light and the room, the, uh, the memory, can live without uh, love, but he personally can't. And I think this is a very heartbreaking thing because he met his wife, who was his fellow student in university, and they got like married one year later, and then they were really, really, really in love. They were still affectionate until he died. So he was, he was in one side, he was very lonely, but he was not because of his wife. He was lonely because he's going to die alone, but he was not lonely because of his wife. Uh, and then the light. I think it's basically the sunlight is like basically a push force, a life force for it. Because you know, you know when we watch a lot of movies and then there's a scene of someone dying in the hospital, they always sit outside, they always sit facing through the windows, right? I think uh, it's the same metaphoric thing there because um, like I die but the world is still going. So it's like it's not a matter of me being. Um, me being sad of dying, I, I just have to accept the fact that I'm dying because the world is really going to the world is not going to end as I die. And then, basically the whole painting itself, I think, like after I analyzed it, I felt that it was like a very heartbreaking artwork because it's one of his last artwork and he was just recalling everything he did in life. I thought it was sad. And then the color yellow, it's, it's normally used as something happy and all, but he made it so, he made it look sad. So he was making every happy memory he had sad because he was going to leave them as he does. Okay, personal reflection of both words. The house. I personally think that the house was never meant to be permanent. I think she expected.
expected that it was going to be broken down because because the entire growth world did that and I and like when it got demolished like she built it in autumn 1993 but it got demolished in January 1994 it's actually really quick but she didn't really stand up to protect the house you know like other people would protect the house not her so I think she was actually she was actually like when she was making it, I think she was already letting go of the house. It's just to capture it for a while, and everything disappears like the growth room. But the growth room is still. And then, uh, uh, from an architectural view, I think she was trying to highlight how development led to the change of lifestyle. Like, the house was very Victorian-ish, but the things that surrounded the house it was developing, it was, it was becoming more urban and it was just, I think she was just sad to see that people were like letting go of their, what they called the original identity, you know, they, they were holding on to their paradigm. <laughs> and uh, the plain colors and the color stains on the, the house, the, the, the cast itself, is I think she was just trying to capture the purest and the most um, uh, broken down uh, memories that were that were built. Do you say building memories? Yeah, that were built inside the house. Uh, she was just trying to express the beauty of the emptiness. It was empty, but it's not empty. You see, she was trying to hide. And then uh, I actually came up with some ideas for paper casting because um, the, the criteria. <laughs> uh, I thought when I was looking at the Rachel White Ridge house, I thought of using like unused drawers, like toy boxes or like jewelry boxes. Because that was basically my everything in my childhood. It's like it was it was my life force when I was ten years ago, maybe twelve years ago. And and I and now that I think about it, I only like liked it because the outside thing looked pretty. But what mattered more, what mattered more was the things I kept inside. So I thought I could, I can try looking for one at home, but I just hope that I can. And then, um, yeah, because I chose to do like this kind of boxes. For some other people, it might look um, just like it's just a box. But and I, I also thought that it was just a box. But that box was basically my entire childhood. So uh, now that I was reflecting, I thought it would it would just like um, imitate Rachel White's intention in uh, casting the house. And then. Uh, I was thinking of I was still I'm still in a dilemma in choosing whether to use plaster or like fill do paper casting in the sense that I I fill that box with tissue paper. I don't think I'm gonna explore both of them. And then suddenly then to uh, basically the room oh explains the state of his health at that time. It was four years before that, like I said earlier, he went through like prost prostate surgeries and, and, and like suffered other medical problems. And he could have felt lonely. I'm sure I'm sure like everyone who's sick they feel lonely. You know? And then there was dusk. Like, I think it was dusk, I don't think it was dawn because it was yellow. Um, it suggested end of the day. Like and I think he was uh, looking forward and as if it's the end of his life. And then uh, he was influenced from just looking at the painting. He was uh, influenced by abstract expressionism. It's just that he didn't really focus on the. Like, he just he just uh, used a lot of strokes. Like I don't think he was very conscious because he was sick. I think I think that's why I, that's like my personal view that he was influenced by abstract expressionism, impressionism, and cubism because.
the rooms are like really really structured and it was three dimensional. And I think if you just take his works as a blueprint, I think they could literally like make a movie. Or a movie. And then he was exposed to surrealism, like there was no shadow of the window pane that makes sense just like the central middle pane. Middle pane. Uh, I think he was like indicating uh, his struggle, like like the pain, like the window pane is his struggle for the decade. Because after he got out of work, he did, his works were recognized for like about ten years or so. So he was really suffering. He was he was basically undergoing poverty. But because his family itself is a middle class, so I think he had funding from families. But there, but it's like his struggle. But there's no cast of shadow. It means people doesn't know that he was struggling. That's my interpretation. <laughs> and then uh, some ideas for studio practice, which I came up with as I was looking through his work, is that it's it's re it's relevant to architecture. So I think I should like really look into a lot of his works because I want to be an architect. Like look, I think I have to like start exploring how shadows cast and how tones and walls are different because of the shadow, because of the light. And then uh, I think that I have to explore like the different tones of certain color, especially using oil paint because I never used oil paint before. I, I need to like know how it can change because I tried with uh, acrylic, it wasn't that efficient when I was painting for Bob Marley. And then I tried with watercolor, but that was quite, it was uh, effective, but it's just a matter of like controlling water. But I think oil paint would be different like the painting. And then I have to like experiment on oil painting because I didn't even use one before. And then I also think that I have to observe the relationship between sunlight and the direction of shadow. Because like during even still life drawings, I find it really hard to cast shadows. Because I just find them very awkward. It's like it doesn't fit to the picture I draw. So yeah. And then Venn diagram. Um I will start with the house and then the sun and then the tube and then the intersection. The house is basically a contemporary art room. She's a, she is one of the YBA. Uh, it's a cement cast. It's something like a sculpture, but it's not a sculpture because it's just so huge. And then it was basically to capture memories of other people whilst reflecting back in her life. Like as I said, she used to live in a Victorian terrace house, and she she couldn't find the her house is the best place on earth and she could have like thought that other people felt it too but it's just that because it was located in Grove Road nobody really cared they just like look down on them and they just disregard them and like the way how they were like shoot out of the community I think she was trying to express that these people have feelings too they have their own memories in the house uh, and then it raised a lot of con controversial issues in the society because it was it was um, delayed development and it was basically reflecting on World War II, which isn't a very good thing at that time because it wasn't quite very after the war. I think. Yeah. And then I think I personally think she had a more masculine approach because. If you think of women, like if people think of women, they would just think that they would just sit in their place, do their thing they have to do. But she, she, like, cement cast the entire building, which I think was more um, macho ish and more heroic. And then, suddenly, so oh, this is the difference between the two. Uh, it's a realism artwork, which is a um, which is basically influenced by a lot of other art movements. And it's an oil and, paint, uh, oil and canvas painting piece. And unlike 
her trying to capture memories of other people as well as hers, he was just reflecting on his own life because he was on his, not on his deathbed, but he was on the way to his death, like very close to death. And then uh, it was suggesting that she was expecting death, but she was just sad about it. And then, uh, the, unlike, the, unlike this, which caused a lot of issues, the painting was just admired because she was, she had this talent of, I think it's a talent because not many people can do it, in like adjusting the um, tone and the opacity of light and shadow, like all these other words. And then, uh, like the house is more masculine, I think um, the sun in the afternoon is more feminine because he emphasized on every stroke. He was very um, precise and everything. So I, I would personally say that it's a feminine approach, but I don't know about your opinion. And then the intersection. Uh, both artworks have the theme of space, emptiness, um, memories, uh, like capturing memories, and then capturing space, capturing time, holding, like expressing a lot of different mixed feelings and in the in the in the room, the house they they built. Then um, they both of them have the this mindset of trying to take something that which was always disregarded, which was never ever cared of, which was never looked into before, into something very extraordinary, something very astonishing, something very motivating. And then both had relevance to architecture, which I which is why I love both.